say it. Okay. You guys want to sit over there? Sit over there. Uh, I call this meeting of the Enterprise Committee to order. It is June 16th. Uh, let's take a roll call right quick. Dean Trini. Where's Doug Clark? Amy Kabaski. Tim Steele. And uh, we've got a few other folks I think are coming um, on around. Quickly. Chair Kingsley. Mark Johnston. Mike Abbott. Paul Bollard. Mark Stafford. Steve Mass. Brett Jokla. Rose Foley. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, and we're going to start out, I guess, with AWU. Uh, you guys got anything going on? Not much. Okay. 56 slides for Okay. Uh, some of the stuff will be repeat information for many of you. Um, but uh, just a reminder that our job is safeguarding public health and the environment. And the three pillars of our business support that commitment physical infrastructure, financial resources, and human resources. Uh, I want to focus today's talk on our strategic plan, which we are in the middle of developing. We worked with our board in uh, April to come up with these five goal, four goals, and uh, I'll uh, build the presentation around those four goals. First being, being responsive to the needs of the community, be the model of innovation and efficiency and service to the public, be a responsible steward of ratepayer funds, and be the employer of choice for existing and future staff. Looking at this strategic plan and these goals as, as ones that have a long life to them. Not, these are not goals that we're going to uh, achieve tomorrow and, and then forget about. This is going to be kind of the principles of how we want to want the utility to operate into the future. Isn't that the way you've been operating all along? Um, I hope so. Okay. I'd like to think so. Go ahead. Um, we've developed several objectives that are, that are a little bit more specific with respect to each of these uh, goals, in the case of, of uh, being responsive to the needs of the community, we want to, of course, provide reliable service at affordable rates. We want to increase the understanding of utility operations throughout the municipality, meaning that we want to be transparent and we want there to be no questions unanswered or no questions that the, the people have that, that are, are troubling. And we want to engage in efforts by the municipality and other stakeholders that address economic development. Uh, so just a few examples of, of how those objectives are being addressed currently. Uh, as we develop the strategic plan further, we will have uh, staff support uh, in developing tasks that they're the subject matter experts in that will drive us toward those uh, specific objectives. Uh, this data is a couple years old, uh, 2011 it appears, um, but it does point out that, that our rates are, are we're in pretty good shape compared to our peers in other communities. The gold bars on the left for water and on the right for wastewater are the rates that, that we charge compared to a number of other communities in Alaska and in the northern <coughs> tier. Uh, so we're right in the middle of the pack on the water between some between Kalispell, Montana, and Billings, Montana, on a on a uh, monthly median uh, charge for water based on median household income. So. If, uh, community like San Francisco is uh, got a very high median household income, then uh, we'll, we'll have uh, transformed the data to take that element out. So based on percent of, of median household income, we're at about, uh, let's see, I think that's about, about six to seven percent. Uh, we're in pretty good shape. On wastewater, we're even better. Uh, some of that has to do with the fact that, that we have two small plants that operate uh, through full tertiary treatment, and one plant, that our biggest plant at Aspen, that operates as a primary treatment plant. So we don't have the expense of operating blowers and, and, and uh, doing all the things that you need to do to have a full uh, complement of secondary treatment. Um, it's important to note that, that uh, the utility rates, this is true for other utilities as well, uh, really just the cost of doing business. Um, and those costs are very light with respect to the cost of raw water. Uh, if you want a bucket of water from the lake, you can go up and get it for free, but what you're really paying for is the infrastructure. Uh, we do actually compensate uh, the, what do you call yourselves, Mark, the, uh, the cooperative, the three, the three utility companies that, that operate the, the 
uh, equipment like hydro project for the for the loss of, of hydroelectric energy when we take about 10% of the water from the lake into the domestic drinking water system. Uh, we have a regulatory cost charge, just like other, uh, we have to pay for our regulators. 2% chemicals and supplies, on uh, down the list. 29% uh, labor, not uh, a huge fraction, so we're not really aligning the pockets of our union workers. Uh, but 40% of our, of our costs are really related to the infrastructure, making sure that we can get the water from the Putin Lake treated and to your tap, and then uh, the wastewater up to Asplund or to the other plants in the equipment group. Um, another community need that, that we've recently uh, come upon is the need for new housing. And uh, of course, new housing is matched by the need for utility service expansion. Uh, pictured here are existing water and sewer service in the area of the powder reserve, uh, the northeast quadrant of the North Eagle River interchange with Glen Highway. Uh, this land is owned by Crew Inc. and they have plans to, to uh, put a lot of houses up there. Well, in order to do that, uh, yeah, they're gonna need water, they're gonna need sewer. And uh, it's been expressed that the cost of the major developments for that size are really beyond their cash flow capabilities. Um, so we've been working with them to, to, to make sure that, that we can provide benefits to utility customers uh, at the same time that, that um, uh, we are uh, expanding service into that area. To do that, we've got a couple uh, areas that, uh, that are new approaches to system expansion that we touched upon last week when Steve and Brian Boss were here. Uh, water Transmission Improvement District and Infrastructure coordination agreement. Uh, we have a sewer trunk improvement district uh, that's already on the books and we use regularly to help defray the cost of, of uh, uh, larger scale infrastructure components. Um, and we intend to mirror that with the transmission improvement district so that the larger scale pipelines that serve the region uh, can uh, can be, this cost can be deferred until um, customers hook up to that uh, part of the system. Uh, with infrastructure coordination, we're looking at, at uh, ways that we can team with private developers to, to uh, find cost savings through leveraging opportunities for their private development as well as serving the interests of our ratepayers. Uh, in both cases, it's important that the cost cause or cost payer principle is preserved, and that's what we're working um, I'm not sure if we made many promises with respect to when you might see uh, ordinance changes or, or proposed tariff changes to accommodate these things. We're still working on those things. It's not quite as quick as, as uh, we had hoped, but we are approaching this carefully. When we uh, dug into the, the code and the tariff, the tariff in particular, it's like a uh, plumbing job. Uh, we took the toilet off the floor and it turns out that the floor is rotting. So there's a few extra planks of tariff that, that we need to fix as we uh, as we approach uh, building in tariff and code improvements to allow us to do these things. So we expect that the, uh, um, probably by the end of the summer, we'll see uh, code changes that will be ready for assembly approval. In the meantime, we'll be working with stakeholders, working with our legal team, both within the municipality and with, uh, with outside council. Uh, make sure that we have fully developed a uh, host of code changes and tariff changes that will accommodate uh, what we're trying to do and have a real parallels between the water and sewer side of the house. So it's going to take a while to, to put this thing together. We're anticipating that uh, our CR approval could take uh, as much as uh, nine months to 15 months. Uh, and in the meantime, once we have the code changes on the books with your approval, we'll, uh, we'll work toward actually um, working on the process of what we have to do to, to make these things happen. And uh, I suspect that there'll be interest in uh, the development community to volunteer their particular projects to help be a test case to pilot the new approach. Thank you. Yeah, if I can real quick. The template. The, uh, <coughs> the, uh, the, the water expansion for the expansion in that particular area, 
we've got the water. I mean, that's not a not an issue. It's a distribution that's exactly that's yeah. the issue. We have a sufficient water supply. But, but for the sewage treatment, I'm worried about if we if that's fully built out, what's going to have to happen to the sewage treatment there? Oh, uh, we have sufficient capacity at at the river for the for the time being. Um, I don't know if it, what what the long term prognosis is for for the volume of sewage that we have coming in in the wastewater management plan. Can right, you speak to that? Right now, Eagle River, the, what we did in the 2014 wastewater management plan was we projected Eagle River at no more than a one percent per year growth rate for the ICER information. Um, that's actually probably a little less than what we're, we're seeing right now, but. Um, in the new developments with, with Eagle River and, and the project that's going on there, we've projected out a build out for 20 plus years out there. So we're, and we're good for the time being, and everything that we're doing out there is projecting 20 more years. Of okay, future. luckily we haven't had growth in Eagle River that we hadn't anticipated. Yeah, yeah. Back on. yeah. Exactly. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, so just a quick word on the challenges and the scheduling concerns. Um, but uh, we want to underscore that. that Although we're not moving as fast as we anticipated last winter, the time saved that we are, are uh, the time spent that we are looking forward to the development of the process, development of the rates, will have uh, time savings when we get the approval and we can uh, we move forward with the process. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about capital budgets. Um, this is a uh, projection of capital budgets over the next few years. Relatively constant through 2020, with uh, uh, some modest increase with, with respect to inflation. Generally, um, we have over 110 projects underway uh, in various states of activity. Uh, a lot of design going on, a lot of construction going on. Uh, the uh, final U and U is is when we get to the point where a new project is used and useful. When we close out the project, we will uh, uh, call it used and useful, and that, at that point, we can put it on the books and, and it becomes part of our rate base. Um, here's a list of the projects that are currently in construction. If you have questions about individual ones, uh, that's why I brought my engineering division director. But uh, we might uh, hold that discussion until. Uh, some point in the future, but uh, you can look down to the list if there's one that's, that's particularly of interest to you, uh, we can address that. Um, we also have a bunch more planned for construction starts this year. So we have a pretty busy year ahead of us, uh, as we typically do. So we're looking at, at uh, hopefully, pretty close to, to um, 80 to 90% of our uh, capital budget appropriation being put into play this year. Um, over the course of all of our capital program, we've got approved budgets of over $302 million, uh, spread over 200 projects. Um, as of uh, the end of May, about uh, nearly half of that has been spent or encumbered. Uh, so we have a backlog of, of another $169 million in active and working backlog. A lot of that has to do with five large projects, which we can speak of in a little bit more detail. The, the biggest one is the Girdwood Wastewater Treatment Plant Phase Two. Uh, also, we're, we're working on Eagle River to, to uh, revise and upgrade the headworks capabilities. That's the, the, the front end of the plant, make that more efficient. Um, we're putting a, a fair amount of, of investment into the Ship Creek Water Treatment Facility uh, to make sure that we have uh, sufficient capacity for water use so that we can continue with the prospect that, that we'll have un, um, unfettered water use at any time at any place in the city. Okay. Mr. Dunbar? Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so I think this might be a question for this slide or perhaps the next slide. Um, and uh, so it looks like some of your biggest projects are sort of expanding outwards, you know, anticipating uh, expansion talked about that the powder reserve and that uh, you know working with those developers but I, I believe when we had a conversation and Steve, when we talked to Steve we talked about how the other place we're looking to hopefully have more housing is in the downtown core in the midtown core where we want you know high density mixed use development for those kind of projects um, and you would express to me at that time that we might have some new infrastructure 
infrastructure concerns there as well, that some of the, the piping might not be sufficient for some of those projects. And I was wondering if that's going to be, you know, if you did this in a couple of years, would that be reflected in some of these large projects, or is, is there another way that you would sort of accommodate those potential kinds of developments? That's an interesting question. I, um, again, I think we have sufficient water supply and sufficient treatment capacity. I don't think that's an issue. I think it's an individual projects and individual uh, uh, areas that, that uh, for which higher density development is slated that we may need to, to do some upgrades to, to go from an 8 inch to a 12 inch uh, water supply line. And uh, uh, we're, we will continue to be working with the planning department to determine what those needs will be. Um, but right now we don't have a specific projects for that built into our CFP. We have general capability built into the CFP, but not specific. So you, you, you believe you can accommodate those projects without sort of the changes might be necessary for powder reserve? Or will? For, for what, what, I, what we talked about with, with you and, and, and Member Wellton was, I, I believe the Midtown, the downtown Kincaid water transmission meeting, that's an $80 million project. That was part of it, I saw that. that that's, that's, that's in the slide. So, so if there's a significant amount of growth and development up in the, the northwest area of, of Anchorage, we don't have the redundancy and resiliency in there to meet that growth demand. So we do have to put more north-south and east-west interconnectivity within our system to be able to handle that. Um, you'll see on, on the assembly agenda on the 21st, the project for uh, an award to HDR Alaska to be able to start that process of analyzing that and how we go about affecting that downtown Kincaid work and bringing that water in for both growth and resiliency into the, the area. I think that's on one of the slides here. Right? That's the next one. Yeah. Oh, there it is. <laughs> um, we identified in the master plan process that uh, that we had uh, some susceptibility to single point of failure in the, in the what we call the loop pipeline around from Northeast Anchorage to Southwest Anchorage. And so our master plan suggested that, that we could provide for redundant water service throughout the, uh, the uh, urban bowl area by completing that loop with the downtown <coughs> Kincaid uh, project. So that's in the works. You should, you should see a consultant selection on that next week. Thank you. Uh, Bureau of still working with DEC to determine what the process requirements are going to be. Uh, that's going to be a spending project, but uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get to closure on that with DEC and begin design early next year. Uh, talked a little bit about the front end equipment and the, the Headworks project at Eagle River and the Ship Creek Rehab project. Uh, these are all projects that are that are uh, in the works now and uh, are dominant in our budget for this year. Uh, next area that, that uh, our strategic plan focuses on is being the model of innovation and efficiency to the public and service to the public. Energy efficiency, technology, streamlining business practices are what's called for. Some of the recent work that we've done in that regard is win awards. The, uh, I'll talk about this a little bit though. These two guys on the right, uh, Buck Bowler and um, John Wilson, um, are part of our valve crew. That is, they have to go out and dig up valves that don't work. And these guys devised a way uh, to access the valve from the surface such that we didn't have to dig it up. So we applied their new tool, which I call a tap daddy, in a probably a, a 20 excavations since November, uh, saving us probably $200,000. So I'm really proud of these guys. And they got a plaque? Yeah. Did they get part of that too? <laughs> <laughs> well, that'd be nice if we had a game sharing program. But we, we, uh, we brought up the idea of game sharing with the, with the union back in the, uh, in the aughts. And at that point in time, the union uh, decided that they really liked service recognition better than game sharing. And uh, so that didn't get very far. But other, other things that we've been working on is uh, reducing the risk of handling chlorine gas. And we talked about this project with you in the past. The, in this, the center uh, is what we used to have, uh, a host of ancient one-ton cylinders of chlorine <coughs> gas that were trucked through town from a single source of supply in Tacoma. Uh, and we decided that's not 
the best approach anymore. That might have worked well for a while. So on the right, uh, Treatment Division Director Dave Persinger and the mayor are, are looking at our new um, on-site hypochloric generation system that, uh, that produces uh, the gas on-site for dissolution uh, and disinfection uh, without the risk of hauling that uh, uh, hazardous gas around. Produces it from what? Sorry? I mean, what's, what's the process that produces it? What are the raw materials? It's a uh, uh, it's salt and okay. power, so it's basically like electrolysis, and there's some um, conditioning you have to do with caustic soda to to make the conditions just right. Um, but it's basically shipping salt is a lot cheaper and a lot safer than shipping chlorine gas. Yeah. I think everybody will agree on. You know about the Ship Creek Key Exchanger that we're working with MLP on um, to uh, bring heat from MLP to service of our customers. You can see the line down at the bottom. Water comes out of the lake typically at 46 degrees. It'll leave the end of your recovery station at about 60 degrees, and thereby keeping the pipes a little bit warmer, uh, reducing some of the risk of, of ground movement around the pipes. Um, and uh, the principal ben benefit, though, is that that uh, customers don't have to heat the water from 46 degrees to, to make coffee. They can heat it from 60 degrees, and that ends up to be uh, millions of dollars of savings in, in uh, energy costs over 10 of years. Yes. Um, this is a really quick question because Mark uh, is also in the room. Has there ever been any discussion about doing inline power generation at the Kootenai Water, the Kootenai Water Treatment Facility around there? Uh, well, the energy recovery station was initially established to to uh, take power off the head, off the flow through there, but it was never completed uh, because we needed that head to take the water through the rest of town. We're uh, really unusual among our peer utilities in that we get all of our water from a lake that's at 860 feet elevation and and that water is delivered to Kincaid Park and to Service High School by gravity. Uh, if we had taken that energy out at that energy recovery station, uh, we'd probably have some pumping down the road. Okay. Um, talk in the past a little bit about asset management and the fact that, that when we're looking at planning our work and, and understanding the, the systems a little bit better, uh, we can reduce the hazards of uh, service disruption. I'm going the wrong way because I'm pushing the wrong button. And this requires some sophisticated tools too. So again, trying to, to push the, the uh, levels of innovation and efficiency in our processes. Um, the illustration in the center is a, is a pipe that's pitted with the corrosion from its variable and corrosive soils. The tools that are in the other illustrations help us determine uh, there are newfangled ways of, of ultrasonic and, and electromagnetic uh, technology to determine how much and where that corrosion is taking place so we can plan better for um, uh, pipe replacements. Um, this example of the Bayshore area uh, started out as a $20 million project. We implemented the uh, analysis um, that we covered in the last slide and ended up with uh, $8 million of fixes instead of $20 million of fixes. So it's definitely worthwhile. Uh, and this assessment of condition and, and uh, uh, has led us to look around the city and, and highlight some of the uh, key points. Uh, so we have in the books, you'll see next week, a, uh, an award for Northern Lights West End of Rigaud water line replacement. Uh, that's about a $10 million project, 50 year old cast iron pipe, and that's, uh, it'll be bid this year. I guess you won't see the award quite yet, but we're pretty close. However, the crystal ball isn't perfect, and the uh, break that occurred last week was just a few hundred feet to the west at the end of that project between another project that was slated a little bit farther west. So I suspect that we're going to start out with a change order yeah. to, to ask the uh, contractor that <coughs> does the job for the Northern Lights West End Debrigaud project to extend his effort a little bit farther to take care of the break that, that uh, and the restoration that's necessary for the pipe just a bit west of Brigaud as well. The uh, bill for that fix uh, was uh, close to or, or actually exceeding $135,000, but close to $20,000 of, of our labor. The biggest bill, though, is getting down the pipe, 
on an emergency basis, bringing it back up, compacting, repaving, replanting curb. That was about $112,000 just for the surface restoration. So uh, we like to be ahead of the game. We have a really good record compared to our peers with respect to the number of breaks that we have. But when we do have a break, and we do have an unexpected break, it's a pretty big bill. Uh, some more work at the uh, railroad, uh, just another one of our larger efforts. Again, uh, one that, that uh, is a result of our assessment conditions and, and trying to recognize and get ahead of the game to fix it before it breaks. Next area is being a responsible steward of ratepayer funds, managing finances for consistent, predictable, affordable rates in the long term, managing utility infrastructure through asset management for long term benefit, and ensuring regulatory compliance throughout the utility. Um, this is a last year's projection of our long term uh, uh, rate increases. Uh, we are working up uh, a new plan, a new long range financial plan as we speak. We have not uh, addressed that with our board or even internally yet, so giving you a little bit old information, but it shouldn't look too different as we look into the future. A big hump in the wastewater rates uh, next few years to accommodate that big project at Girdwood, uh, but hopefully some settling down and, and uh, consistency with respect to the water rates uh, for the long term. A number of other financial indicators that we use uh, have a lot to do with debt, Debt service, debt burden to asset value, debt service coverage, um, and making sure that we're trying to get as much equity, uh, much use, as much use of equity as, as is possible, so we can reduce that long-term debt. Our goal is, is our one of our principal uh, financial markers is the debt to equity ratio. We are striving for a um, that our that our capital be consisting of. 33% debt and 67%, no, I'm sorry, the other way around. 33% equity and 67% debt. And it's a bit of a, a bit more of a struggle for the wastewater side than the water. But uh, uh, through the use of our long-term planning and, and adherence to the plan, uh, we expect to, to be in the ballpark. Uh, as you know, reauthorization of the EPA discharge permit at uh, the Aspen plant is overdue. We discharge about 28 million gallons a day. The plant's in the, up, in the left side of the, of the uh, photograph here. The blue line is an underground line that goes to the beach. There's a tower at the beach that you recognize if you walk down there. Then about 820 feet offshore is the discharge point. Um, every bit of flow that comes into the sewage system in uh, the bowl area gets treated at this plant. So. Uh, anybody suggest to you that, that we're providing partial treatment or, or uh, dumping a, a portion of raw sewage into the, into the uh, inlet, uh, you can tell them that that's not true. Every drop goes through the screening, the sedimentation basins, and the disinfection process. Um, again, to remind you, we did a uh, biological evaluation with respect to endangered species in 2011, and uh, our finding was that we're not likely to affect endangered species when EPA gets to the point where uh, they are ready to reauthorize. And that will trigger federal action. EPA will take up the uh, biological evaluation and presumably endorse it. Is there a date for that? I mean, is <clears throat> do they come back every so often, or do they, uh, or do they show up as needed? Or the the permits are. Are written for five years. Okay. Our last permit was reauthorized in 2000. So since 2005, we've been uh, working on an administratively extended permit, and uh, uh, there hasn't been um, a discussion with EPA about specifically when they would uh, go back and make a decision on reauthorization. So, yeah, I suspect it's to our advantage not to have them. Uh, <laughs> they haven't come back for a while, but uh, uh, I'm sure they're under political pressure. To I'm sure they're under political pressure in a number of, in a number of different ways, and uh, and I think it's just easier for the agency to uh, continue to administrative extend than not. Okay. Keep going. I don't want to take up too much of your time here. Uh, 
reminder that if we did go to secondary treatment, we're talking about three quarters of a million to over a billion dollars. Three quarters of a billion to over a billion, a billion dollars of work. Uh, so the, the uh, significance of, of holding on to that permit is important. Yeah, Mr. Trent. Didn't all of the Brendan Sim experience on the end of church ferry, or they go to secondary treatment? Uh, which community? All of them. Honolulu went to secondary treatment. Um, I think it was a huge cost. They had a huge cost. The Delta had a huge timeline uh, to do that. They actually had two plants discharging, and I think it was like five miles offshore. And one was uh, already treated secondary, and the primary plant was was also using that same offshore. And um, then they ran into a few mistakes. Uh, there was a failure to maintain the sewage system adequately, and the sanitary sewage overflow uh, spilled out onto the Waikiki Beach, closed the beach for like two weeks. That raised a few eyebrows, and, uh, and not specifically as a result of that, but I'm sure that weighed in the decision for EPA to say, look, you gotta get your act together, you gotta, you gotta uh, make your system more uh, robust, and uh, this primary treatment modification that you have under Section 301H of the Clean Water Act is going to go away. So Honolulu says, we've got a lot of things to do here. Uh, you're asking us to do a lot. We don't have the resources to do all that at once. And EPA says, okay, we'll develop a compliance schedule. And based on meeting certain uh, thresholds, you'll have up to 33 years to complete your conversion to a secondary. So that was six, eight years ago now. Um, so they're marching toward that, that goal. Presumably that they're taking care of some other environmental issues that the EPA was landing on. I said the cost was enormous. And we look at that to go to secondary here. The it's cost is huge. For, for folks like, uh, I know Forrest was not necessarily involved, but um, we, have some, we have some land uh, out at the airport that is sometimes covered by other Airport is also thinking of another runway, and uh, uh, it's critical that we maintain the flexibility to do the work necessary to upgrade that plant uh, or to have the property that would allow us to be able to do that out there. Otherwise, it's a, it's a huge issue. So, we need to maybe keep that thing in mind when uh, folks come, come looking at us for uh, <coughs> uh, additional constraints to use of that property. We've done the monitoring. We've shown time and time again that the plant is all permanent conditions, that there's low levels of trace contaminants. We can see it. That doesn't mean it's necessarily a bad thing. As, as uh, someone once said, it's the dose that makes the poison, not the fact that that particular constituent exists. Uh, in the background, the glacial soot provides a lot of the metals that we're seeing discharge as well. So actually, we have more metals in the glacial silt than we're discharging in terms of copper and lead and selenium. Um, we keep going back to look. We're doing that uh, in the next week or so, and uh, we'll determine again that there are no water quality effects, no toxicity in bioassays of critters, no accumulation of toxic materials, no setup effects of the outfall, no contamination of the outfall. And the effluent that we provide is pretty close to what secondary effluent would be anywhere else in the country. So uh, to have us spend that kind of money for a very limited effect doesn't make sense. And thank you for the current. Yeah, <laughs> we're big fans of the tides. Uh, the last area is being the employer of choice for existing and future staff. Uh, composition of the staff is changing. We've had a significant uh, turnover of uh, staff over the past few years. Uh, and uh, But recruiting and hiring is still a significant challenge. This shows the number of hires that we make in any given month through the course of uh, much of the last year, and the uh, number of vacancies exceeds the number of hires. So the, uh, if you take the, the ratio of the two, the average time to get somebody hired on board is, is really on the order of three to four months. It takes a long time to do that. It's gotten a little worse uh, in the past couple months. Uh, uh, 
uh, it, it's, it looks worse, uh, but actually we're kind of holding a couple positions that were approved in the budget for one quarter funding for 2016 uh, for our own and crews. So we have uh, identified these positions, but they're not funded until the, the last quarter of this year. So um, we're still looking at, at uh, a three to four month time frame to get people on the board. Um, there are some positions that are particularly hard to fill. Um, we get a lot of competition in the mechanics field from other even other municipal agencies. Uh, instrumentation and control guys uh, can work in the oil patch and make a lot more money than they make working for the city. In fact, uh, uh, electricians can make a lot more money working for Mark and IBEW than they can work than working for us. So, so there are there are differences and there are difficulties with respect to, to uh, keeping staff on board and mechanics staff. So that's a challenge for us. Um, one of the areas that, that uh, we can do is to try and make sure that we have the best engagement of employees as possible. In the uh, um, Anchorage Economic Development Corporation luncheon of 2014, Jim Clifton, the head of Gallup, came and talked about his book, The Coming Jobs War. And in that, he describes uh, Gallup's work to identify through surveys 12 critical elements of work life. And, uh, and he proposed that as a, as a questionnaire uh, uh, with a statement and then a, a agree to disagree, agree or disagree on a Lockhart scale. I put that out in front of millions of employees and uh, came up with a pretty succinct definition of what it entails to be uh, engaged as an employee. Uh, we uh, borrowed those questions and uh, we recognize that we can make comparisons over time and between groups and the next few slides are, are a quick look at, at the 2014 and 2016 results from the water utility. Uh, I know it was expected of me. Pretty much we get pretty good agreement on that from, from our staff and, and we had some uh, improvements from 2014 to 2016 among people that, that agree uh, very much so have the materials and equipment I need to do my job right. Well, it didn't do quite as well in comparison between 2014 and 2016 on this one. But we have a, uh, a, a boost in the, the number three area that, that is neutral about the state. So we need to be able to look to make sure that we're doing the right thing here. Uh, at work I have the opportunity to, to do what I, I do best every day. Uh, for the most part, people enjoy coming to work in utility and, and uh, uh, and get a chance to, to practice their craft. In the last seven days I've received recognition or praise for doing good work. Having positive feedback is immensely important to employee engagement. And uh, we think we've made some, some positive inputs here over the past couple of years. My supervisor or someone at work seems to care about me as a person. Well, I think most people like to be cared about it. And, uh, and it appears we scored reasonably well in, in that arena. Uh, actually improved that over the past couple of years. Summer worker encourages my development. I'll just get down to the rest of these. At work, my opinion seemed to count. The mission of my organization makes me feel my job is important. My fellow employees are committed to doing quality work. This is a weird one. Not, it's not clear to me why having a best friend at work uh, makes a more, more engaged employee. And I think it also puzzles our staff because they haven't figured it out either. They don't know that, uh, that having a best friend at work is important to engage. In the last six months, someone has talked to me about my progress. We made some improvements in the past couple years on this area. And lastly, given the opportunities to work and learn and grow is important to employee engagement. And it's, it's something that, that we have to depend on as public employees because, uh, as I said, we can't pay the mechanics and pay the, the INC guys and, and pay folks the way that we can make money in private money. So, um, Mayor Berkowitz uh, was introducing me to, to some folks that came up. And uh, I'm not sure why he said this, but it kind of surprised me. He said, no, no, I mean it, I mean it in all the good ways. Well, I count the number of good ways, I suppose. <laughs> but uh, if 
that's the label that the, that the mineral supply will take. So, lastly, a reminder that our simple transparent message to the public is that we're investing to make all these fixes in the pipe to ensure reliable service, safe our public health, protect the environment, not just today for my term here or your term on the assembly, but long into the future as well. That's all I got. Questions quickly. And we'll try and hear from the other field. And Mr. Uh, and as well. Yeah. Um, no questions. Um, thank you. I'm sorry that we're in kind of a certainly appreciate you guys coming back. I know you've got a lot of work going on this summer. Um, looks like you're doing a good job. Try to. Mike Abbott uh, always says to us, uh, boy, I never say that. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bill Field, right away. Thank you, Captain. Mr. Chairman, uh, can we, uh, at, can I ask that Mark be allowed to make a five-minute presentation on an item that's before the assembly on Tuesday night? Okay. Give quickly. folks a chance to yeah. ask any questions or raise any them. issues. And then, if there's not enough time for Paul, he's more than available to come back at a later time. Or if you can go a little long uh, today, Paul can conclude his presentation. I'd like to go a little long, but we've got there another event. Okay. So if it's okay with you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mark? I, I think everybody can hear me from here, but if you'd like, I'll actually move up to the table. Uh, I don't know. Is there a microphone there that's recording me? Okay. I will or speak up, one or the other. I'll, I'll do both. I'll move over and I'll speak up. <coughs> I just wanted to uh, let you know about uh, an item that is on the agenda for Tuesday night. It is a change order for $2 million for IEC. IEC is the project engineer. Uh, for the owner, uh, us, MLMP, on the Plant 2A project. We, uh, we have been working diligently with the contractor, and as you know, we reported a couple of, uh, I believe a couple of meetings ago, that uh, they, we've extended the time for the substantial completion of the plan from June 12th to August 11th. In working through that and some other issues, we anticipate that they may have difficulty in meeting that schedule. And this change order is being put in to accommodate a smooth transition for IEC should the project slip beyond the August 11th date. <coughs> what I will also tell you is that we have received uh, notice from the contractor that, that uh, they believe there were two issues that have slowed them down. One related to the GIS, that's the equipment that allows the plant to that generate the electricity and then put it into the system. We're cu currently using that to backfeed the plant from our system so the plant can operate and they can do things within it construction-wise. The second was related to GE and the turbine uh, bringing them up to uh, first fire, which we anticipate will happen sometime next week with Unit 9 and on the 30th for Unit 10. We have responded to both of those notifications and um, explained in detail why we don't believe that we have, in fact, caused them any delay. We don't anticipate that that's the end of the story. We think that they will provide us with a claim at some point in the future, one of them potentially today, and then the other um, at some point in the future. We don't know what the claims will be as to monetary or additional time that they may request. But that's uh, the impetus behind us asking for the change order so that we are prepared in the event that the plant runs longer than we anticipate at this junction. And I'd be happy to try and answer any questions that you might have. I'll tell we have questions, but I need to read the action first. Um. Um. Uh, obviously, if there's just to, if there's questions about the status of the potential dispute with the prime contractor, we would need to go into executive session, and like we did a couple of months ago when we informed you about <coughs> the need for the uh, extension of the <coughs> substantial completion date. So we're prepared to do that. Um, there's not a lot of new information related to that, but uh, what Mark's describing is. 
money we hope we don't have to spend, but we need our sort of our expert on board yeah. and ready to support the project if in fact some of these contingencies come to pass. So the purpose for running that was to save the works. So uh, that's going to be well. We will we will know whether or not it uh, generates electricity next week. Yeah. Um, uh, for Unit 9 and then the following week for Unit 10. And then it's just uh, a question of finishing the rest of it so that we can then bring it online. Mike, when do you think we need the executive session? I don't think you do, <laughs> but that's easy for me to say. I've had all my questions yeah. answered, so uh, it's easy for me to say that. But otherwise, it would be um, this, it would be on Tuesday night. We do request assembly action on Tuesday night. The reason I bring it up is we already have an executive session plan on full dedication. So we need to have another. And that's tomorrow, right? Yeah, yeah it's tomorrow. But we need to have one on Tuesday. So you and I have times we get a plan. Yeah, and I, like I say, I, I defer to the assembly. If you read the material, uh, there's a pretty good uh, AM written for this. If you think it, you need more information in order to um, uh, feel comfortable voting on it, then I believe a relatively brief executive session, you know, at dinner or thereabouts would be satisfactory. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Thank you. Um, good. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. We'll see what happens. Uh, see what happens. Real field. You guys haven't had any action out there for a long time. Ten minutes to do it. I don't know what time we all have. Can you guys go till twelve fifteen or so? Sure. Uh, we can. Okay. We will. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. If somebody has to go. Okay. My name is Paul Bowers, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to do this. Well, how do you get this? Did uh, for those of you not familiar with Merrillfield, this is the first airport in Alaska since 1930. It's built on top of the former landfill. About 40% of the airfield is on top of the airfield or landfill that was closed in 1987. So we, when you drive on the Merrillfield Drive, those are naturally occurring speed bumps because of the differential settling of the underlying track. That's a real problem. The airport is limited to 12,500 pounds or less, exceptions for maintenance, air shows, and emergencies. We've got an FAA tower from 7 a.m. to midnight, 10 p.m. non-summer hours. There are two, now soon to be three, fixed wing flight schools, two, watercraft flight schools, 45 businesses, 51 leases, and 19 rentals, and lots of permittees. And it's one of the few airports in the country that actually has a taxiway that goes directly to the emergency room at the regional hospital, to a hospital. Obviously, it's the only one going to regional hospital. <coughs> the airfield is basically north, south, east, west, and then the runway on the lower side is the Whiskey Taxiway, and this is a gravel strip, and that's for Thunder Tire equipped aircraft. The development that I've talked about is basically, uh, mostly there's a paint hanger here, hanger development here, 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 and here. And there's another one that's just completed over here another one that will be done next year down in this area. This actually will be the busiest construction period for Merrill Field in its history in 2016. Uh, the categories are that. Uh, from a management report point of view, our noise complaints will be perpetual, uh, but they are down compared to what they've been in previous years. Vehicle pedestrian deviations are either a person or a vehicle driving on a controlled surface where they're not supposed to be. And you only have those at towered airports. We've got six so far this year. There is no way to predict them. That's down substantially from 
13 and 17 in the previous year. So uh, compared to what it used to be, there's nothing that's not as good as it can be. And it's not for lack of effort to get them trained up, but that's the way it is. I started doing uh, quarterly user meetings with the users. That's the first Wednesday of each quarter. That seems to improve the communication to a degree. We just finished our second ever airport-wide uh, insecticide spraying. But about five years ago, grasshoppers started showing up. Three years ago, there were so many grasshoppers out there that the pavement looked like it was moving. And as a result, seagulls found that pretty attractive. So we sprayed last year, it virtually finessed the bird problem. We had occasional gulls fly over looking for something and they weren't finding it. And we've already had a few seagulls show up with grasshoppers this year. We just finished spraying it. It's already knocked down the bird problem. And birds and aircraft just are not real compatible. So, and we're, we have initiated a an airport-wide crack sealing program uh, two years ago, and we will do all the sites on field. Uh, historically, uh, my predecessor took the position that we don't have the money for crack sealing, and you tenants take care of your own leased sites. That's fine, but then they didn't take care of them, and then they come back to the airport and say, your asphalt's failed, you need to replace it a whole lot cheaper to do crack sealing than it is to replace the asphalt. So that's, we're making a big dent to that. Frankly, from a, an appearance point of view, I think the airport looks terrible when you have weeds going through cracks everywhere. So it's getting better. From a leasing point of view, there's those are the items, paint hanger, north edge hanger, less aircraft engines, and that's Lake Clark Air, Jayhawk, Premier hangers on the west side. Reeve Airmotive is now bought up by uh, the Alaska Airframes, and they are going to turn that into an Alaska Super Cup Center. They build infrastructure or superstructure, everything from the fuselage down for an aircraft. They want to make a Fifth Avenue exhibition hall, if you will, to house two Super Cup to show what they built, struts, wheels, Breaks, everything below the fuselage. That's all built in Alaska. Uh, Contour, I'll get to that. The in the Air Park's former Aerotech site. Uh, Aero Twin is building what they're, they're going to build a hangar. This is the paint facility. That's, here's the tower in the background. That facility is 16,400 feet. It'll be big enough, literally, to paint DC-3-8 South 340-side airplanes. Uh, that's a, you don't find a lot of paint hangers around the country. That's an EPA, DEC compliant infrared baking system so that when they finish painting an aircraft, they should be able to send it up for within three hours after they finish painting it. That's really impressive. Uh, what's in uh, Pen Air? Example on your South 340s that fly around YK in particular. Every two years they send them down south to be repainted at a hundred thousand a pop. And they make that up in fuel savings from the slippery surface. Frankly, I think I'd hire a bunch of high school kids and blacks with the Jesus out of it, but that apparently doesn't hold up under 300 miles an hour all kind of weather. So that is now going to be done here. That's 100,000 per aircraft. And they've got a bunch of And this aircraft is big enough to segregate into four quadrants and paint the four 206 size aircraft simultaneously. They expect to do, if it works, you can do one plane a week. They can do up to four a week. And that's, that's going to be good business. It's the only one in Alaska. They'll draw traffic throughout the state, Western Canada, and frankly, they'll draw traffic from down south. If you're sitting there in the Northwest, <coughs> you can go to Arizona, Amarillo, Alabama, or Anchorage. And when you're doing it on a company dime, you can go play Teresa in Anchorage for a week, go home with a new paint job. Who beats the heck out of going to the south in the summer? 
I suspect traffic will slow up a bit today. Satellite marketing. Uh, North Edge Hangar is, this is what it will look like. This is Doc McNamara. This is the northwest corner here. This is their existing facility. The new one will be about two and a half times the size of the existing. We've got foundations <coughs> in now. That uh, Stoddard's is over here in the corner. And this, right up in this area, is the intersection between Fifth Avenue and Airport Heights. To give you a reference on feel. That is, that will be up and running this fall. <coughs> Classic aircraft engines, that's on Merrill Field Drive. This is the hangar they've got going up. And if I uh, show you this, uh, this is the, the form they use is this. And basically, if this is styrofoam, just like you have on a styrofoam cooler. These are plastic tied together. That sets, there's male-female portions that come together just like an erector set, and that in turn sets on a conventional foundation. That is poured, if you look here, there's the concrete uh, crane that's feeding that, and that is a unibody construction. It is earthquake proof, wind proof, and has an R48 insulating value. If you've got insulation like this in your attic, you're R30 has a decibel rating of 45. You can literally run a jet on one side of it and not get it on the other side. Pretty phenomenal. This is the first such construction in Alaska. Alaska Aircraft, Alaska Aero Twin, right next door. When they finish with this one, they're going to move next door and make a 70 by 100 foot hangar with them. So it's it's a process. I think you're going to see a lot more of No steel. No steel. And this has a wood. No, no rebar. No rebar. Right. This is, a, there's still plenty of steel on the roof. Well, actually, the roof on this is all wood truss. So, frankly, there really isn't much steel. There's rebar and footings that ties into what's filled on top. But basically, this is a freestanding concrete structure, five and a half, six inch slope, so that it's not too juicy to where the rocks settle up the bottom because it's it's kind of pear shaped. Hey, Paul, move on. I'm moving on. <laughs> no, no, don't talk okay. concrete technology. All right. Uh, J Bar. J Bar. Their construction materials in front of the hangar, 4,800 feet. That will be, they're planning on putting that up this fall. Uh, Premier hangars on the west side, uh, they were built last fall. They're selling them at a mere 299000 each. Uh, the Alaska Super Cup Center is the one that we're talking about on the north side. That will, is planned for next year. Uh, the contour lease, well, I'll go to these two first. This is the former Aerotech site. They are looking at four separate multi-unit combination business individual hangars. Aero Twin is going to build a 7,000 foot next to the Alaska aircraft engine. Contour lease, that's where the old Quonset huts were. And they have, their lease said that they had to move them. They moved them within 90 days, they did. Also said they had to build the first of two planned hangars by November 1, have the construction started by May 1. They did not comply with that. He had no plans to do so. So we're in the process of terminating his lease and he is protesting that termination. I think that's a phone call I died. I'm sorry? I said, I think that's a phone call I died. Marketing or is it demand uh, that, um, in the it's, area? Or what is it? It's a combination of things, but one, I'll get to the answer to okay. that question. I'm sorry, sure. go ahead. Uh, this is the, the uh, project upgrades. Uh, I'll go through each of those. This is the current process on the north side. We're redoing the fencing. This is what the old fence was here. New fence has this curved outward arch on top. The same concrete jersey barrier on the bottom is there. We're resizing taxiway kilo so that it, it, this checkerboard area will be gone. 
you know, match on the south side. That's actually technically too wide without supplemental signing and lighting in the middle. And this reduces our cost of operation, and we don't need it. We've got plenty of room for folks queuing. We just don't need it. It's, it's overdue to be done. On the west side, the former city electric property was bought last year with AIP funds, and we're, we went through the process of offering any of that to the city. Nobody is interested. We're now putting it out for the bid package and hopefully to use the same facility. It did not have a taxiway adjacent to it, so it was physically segregated from the rest of the airport air operations area. We are building that this year, and the intent is to use street folks to do it. The advantage to that is that street maintenance folks. I'm sorry? Street maintenance folks. I'm sorry, yeah, street it's maintenance folks. my ears perked up. Can you see me? Not uh, street urchins, if you will, street maintenance. And that means it doesn't have to be Davis Bacon. We don't have to go through the engineering process. They do that type of work without a problem. And it's, that should have cut our cost by literally two thirds. Uh, the budget, our budget, we've got a pretty meager operation, meager staff. Our actual revenue for 715 was 1.7. We projected here as of this year so far. We're, uh, the year is 41.7% done. We're at 44% of the budget. Our operating expenses uh, are substantially less. Uh, same thing here. So far, we've expended 45.4. Uh, that includes our winter ops, so we're, we're in good shape. Uh, we have set up, a few years ago, we set up an operating reserve and that basically is 5% of our revenue budget because we had no reserve set aside. And uh, last year, we also set up a capital improvement sponsor share. And when I was the state aviation director, I set aside a program where the state paid half of a sponsor share for the non-state airports. Last year, the state rescinded that. And they sent a letter out uh, the third week in October saying, by the way, three weeks ago is when we stopped it. A bit hard to plan for. So bottom line, uh, we had a net in 15 of 300,000, and our net is projected uh, 53 here, but that actually includes both the operating reserve of 5% and 125,000 of the operating reserve. So the actual budget proposed would be about two and a quarter that's not what you will see when you see the typical presentations from the, uh, when it goes to the budget process because historically the capital expenditures have been listed as operating expenses and the FAA grants have been listed as operating revenue. Well, they don't always coincide in the same year. So you have this system where one year we gained $3 million, and next year we've lost $2 million, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know how you follow that, but that's what we've got. So this is a more realistic picture, I think. Um, what we have done uh, in the last few years, we are required to adjust our annual leases not more than five-year periods. Historically, the airport has done that <coughs> five years, six years, seven, eight, 10, 12 years. And then it all comes in arrears. So the tenants get slapped upside the head with a treasure 10 year increase. And of course, the assembly doesn't approve the budget until mid December. So they get two weeks notice before they have to implement it the following January 1st. Not a lot of advance notice. Not a lot of predictability, not a lot of stability. But what we did, starting in for the 14 budget, I arrived there March of 13, we started to incorporate annual CPI adjustments, consumer price index. We had an anchorage CPI, and basically we look at the last known year, which is for us now, it's 2015. We 
we ex extrapolate that, project that for our current year, and that will be our increase or decrease for the following year. If we're over or above, we adjust it at the time. Uh, for example, in 2013, we knew that the rate would be 3.1% based on the 13. So we projected that as the rate for 13. Turned out that was 1.6% higher than the actual. So we took 1.6 away and we adjusted up and down each year. As a result, uh, and for the last two years, we haven't had a change based on the fact that our rate was 20.8 cents per square foot per year and the increase of one tenth of one percent made a 0 0.0002 cent increase so we left it where it was. The projected rate for 2017 using this two year CPI based adjustment will actually be one tenth of a cent decrease in our rate. That's as we told the tenants at the time, if the CPI goes up, we go up, if it goes down, it goes down. Now we know what these numbers are when we send it in to the assembly in September. It doesn't get through the process until you all finally approve it in December. What we do is tell the tenants in August, this is what your projected rate will be next year. They've got three and a half to four months to build it into the business plan. If it turns out it's different than that, it'll be a negligible difference. That provides economic stability, predictability, and I think that is a significant factor relative to why folks are building up there. Do it simply. So, and the beauty of this is that historically we had to go through a negotiation process. It's well laid out, but it's 45, 60, 90 day process throughout. And when you get to the end of it, if you're not satisfied, you do an appraisal. It costs five, six, seven thousand dollars for an appraisal. On a lease lot, it generates five, six, seven thousand dollars worth of revenue. It doesn't make sense. So what we're doing is if we find that there's a real big difference between Merrill Field, for example, what Anchorage CPI is, we can still do an appraisal. Appraisals are really difficult at airports. What are your comparables? They really aren't comparables. So that's the process we go through. Communication with the uh, with the tenants. Uh, do you have regular meetings? Do you have what is uh, what is the process? They're obviously uh, happier uh, with the uh, uh, with the predictability on some of those things. Yeah, I I literally set up quarterly meetings during the day so they don't have to come in after work. It's 3 to 5 p.m. first quarter of each month, Wednesday afternoon. Plus we have MAC meetings that are open to the public. We put the agendas out on the MAC meetings and I've got an open door policy. I think everyone there knows if they got a question, they can call or stop it. It's a pretty open communication process. I think overall the tenants are pretty pleased with what's going on. Security update. Uh, as I noted, this is the fencing detail on the north side. Uh, the, there's now three strand barbed wire atop the existing chain link fence in most of the area, not all. The built <coughs> barrier gate, all of this area was on pilings. And over the past 12, 15 years, the land has dropped over a foot. If the pilings are right where they were, so the gate was kind of perched. Is it literally that much space below it? And you said that's not MLMP's problem, right? Well, no. or no, who, who, uh, AWW? Solid waste. Solid waste. That's an it's, it is, it is a, it's yeah. a problem. They had a big maintenance issue out there a number of years ago. Yeah. So, bottom line, we, our staff lowered this as low as we can get it. At least now a German Shepherd doesn't have to, they have to scoop down to get under it rather than just walk through the fair. Uh, we are putting in, uh, as part of the project we're now doing, we're putting cameras onto the tower so we'll actually have one way five to three east-west one way covered. It isn't now. The existing analog 
and digital cameras, the analogs are going away. The digital two megs will be changed to five megs. That will give us much better picture fidelity. And we'll have new cameras. All the gate operators they today are positive ingress, passive uh, egress. That is to say, you need a touchpad or a mag card reader to get on, but it's a motion detector to get off. Pretty easy to fool. You can take your hat off, throw it over the motion detector, and the gate opens. It would just be ridiculous. So that is being fixed. And the vandalism issue we had June 2nd, that was 87 aircraft, puncture tires between midnight and 5 a.m. Uh, we don't know who it is yet, but all the rest. Uh, that is now why Crime Stoppers and APD says that Crime Stoppers really is affected from vandalism because. It's, it gets the word out there that there's a, a reward that's readily available. You can turn it in anonymously. And the low lives <coughs> who tend to do this tend to say, that was me and their peer group. And the peer group says, gosh, I can pick up a thousand dollars bucks for that. I can do that. So they said, usually that's a week or two after the fact. We haven't seen it so far. But the insurer, we still got videos to review. The regional hospital video showed the uh, whiskey area, and the, one of the hangar operators showed on the south side that wouldn't show us the video. They wanted to go to APD. In fact, APD has two investigators assigned, one of which probably went on a pre planned vacation for two weeks, so that didn't delay there. But uh, Alaska Bush Wheels is bigger than big wheels. They're providing a 20% discount to every user with a punctured wheel. Mount Pitt and Fairbanks, Bellcourt Aviation is actually offering used, but still airworthy tires for pricing of gear type aircraft. And they will cover the shipping if you don't get the anchors. Uh, there's various rewards offered, and uh, we're going through additional patrols. We're adding cameras, fencing, security updates, Contract security all being pursued, but I'm not going to answer that. You used to be able to just drive through the airport. Right. The irony yeah. is, Merrill Field is the most secure GA airport in this state, and by far more secure than most GA airports. Yeah. Yet, and the irony, too, is that all of the aircraft that were vandalized were behind security devices. Yeah. There are hundreds that are setting up where you can. Literally walk up, drive up, and do whatever. Every tire was punctured, including the tail wheels. And there was one amphib out there, and unfortunately, they got six tires on the head. So, the way it is. I suspect there's more to that story. Yeah. Yeah. Point yeah. Point. yeah. yeah. But that's it. So, more questions? Anything else you want to tell us? That's it. Unless you got time. Yeah, that's uh, folks. Folks want to go a little early, and we're a little late on the uh, on that. So, uh, if there's no more questions. Go ahead and call. Thank you very much. For Thank you, Mr. Chairman.